start by thanking the organizing for, for arranging this very interesting meeting in a very nice place. Uh, the topic I'm going to talk about uh, may be described as uh, cosmology with small c and leading to questions that perhaps have to do with philosophy with small p. But um, I hope nevertheless you, you, you'll find some, some interest in it. Uh, the, the work I'm going to talk about has involved collaborations at different stages with uh, all these uh, uh, colleagues. And the plan of the talk uh, is the following. Uh, the inflationary ac account of the, uh, for the emergence of the seeds of cosmic structure and the problem that uh, we find with, with that account. Uh, I will review briefly the answers that one uh, usually finds among the inflationary cosmologists when, when one uh, asks this, raises this, this kind of issues. Uh, and I'm going to devote a little bit of time to say what are the, the shortcomings that we, that we find. And I'm do, go, doing this not because uh, I just want to say, you know, somebody is wrong or not, but uh, it's only when we are very, uh, you know, strongly convinced that the standard approaches are not fully satisfactory that one may attempt to, to, to introduce something very dramatic, some, in some sense, revolutionary idea. Uh, our, our approach will be uh, to introduce something that uh, perhaps uh, in this audience should not be uh, considered such a uh, revolutionary idea because it has an old, it has some long history, and these are uh, the theories developed, some of the approaches developed to address the measurement problem, and they go by the name of spontaneous collapse theories. I will then uh, briefly describe one of these uh, uh, theories called uh, continuous spontaneous localization and show uh, how one can adapt uh, such theory to uh, uh, the, the situation at hand and in particular to quantum field theory, which is part of this, what's required to treat the, this issue uh, in, in the inflationary context. Uh, and finally, to say that comparing with observations can, can uh, teach us something about uh, this endeavor. Uh, so, as you all know here, uh, contemporary cosmology uh, uh, involves an inflationary uh, era as, as one of its uh, central components. Uh, and uh, it, it was motivated by various, various issues, but nowadays the most spectacular uh, claim that it has is uh, its claim to account for the seeds of cosmic structure and the correct prediction of the spectrum. The starting point of this uh, analysis is the idea that after uh, inflation starts, after a few e efforts of inflation, the space-time will be described very closely by a Robertson flat Robertson Walker uh, space-time inflating under the influence of a, a scalar field that is excited only in the zero mode, in the homogeneous mode, and that leads to an almost the sitter uh, expansion. And on top of this background, one considers perturbations uh, both of the scalar field and of the metric, and uh, argues that this, per this perturb oh, okay, quantizes these per perturbations, argues that this that the natural state for these perturbations should be something like the uh, uh, Bunch-Davis vacuum. And from, this, uh, and from this analysis, one obtains this uh, uh, primordial inhomogeneities in terms of the quantum fluctuations of the fields in this particular uh, state. So we, we all know that this, uh, that this story uh, fits spectacularly, spectacularly well with the with the data, and, uh, and that, uh, that's the, the big claim to success of, of, of the inflationary uh, component of, of, of our understanding of, of cosmology. Uh, the oscillations here have to do, of course, with late time physics associated with plasma oscillations. These are well understood, and I will ignore them from now on. I will concentrate on the uh, 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 seeds that are supposed to emerge 
from inflation for which the spectrum should be basically flat in this, in this uh, diagram. Um, so as I said, the theory fits extremely well with the, with the observation and, and one would be tempted to say, well, that, that's it. Everything fits fantastically well. What else do we want? But let's look at the following issue. The universe, according to this description, at that stage in which we start considering the inflationary regime, is, a, is homogeneous and isotropic, both at the level that can be described as classical, let's see, the, the background, and also at the quantum level in which the fluctuations are uh, uh, described. Uh, so except for remnants that one may uh, imagine uh, uh, surviving the inflationary uh, stage, which should be suppressed by a, by a um, Ex, ex, by, by a very small, uh, uh, oh, sorry, suppressed by a very large number uh, associated with the number of efaults uh, that I will also ignore from now, the universe is completely homogeneous and isotropic. The quantum state, even though it contains fluctuations, is perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, <clears throat> as can be easily uh, checked. So we end up, nevertheless, for example, already at the stage of the, of the uh, CM, of the last scattering surface from, where, from which the CMB uh, is emitted, uh, with a universe that contains inhomogeneities, uh, and those inhomogeneities are supposed to grow as, as, as uh, we, we saw in the, in the simulations uh, on Saturday, uh, into the galaxies and, and, and stars and things that, uh, that allow our own existence to emerge. And I we would like to understand how does something like that happen? How does the symmetry, homogeneity, and isotropy break, given that the dynamics uh, preserves the, the symmetry, and given that I don't want to bring into account, we don't want to involve the observer in as playing any role in the early uh, in, in the early inflationary time, where, where of course not, not, no such observer can be involved. Uh, this problem is, is similar to a problem considered by, by Mott in 1929 uh, co uh, concerning the alpha nuclear decay uh, of a particle which, which uh, you know, a, consider a J equals zero nucleus decaying, which we know produces in our uh, theory a spherical wave that expands, uh, characterizing the, the alpha decay, and nevertheless leaves straight lines in the in the bubble ch chamber, uh, I thank Bob Wall for pointing me to this problem many years ago. Um, and uh, of course the problem is connected with the measurement problem, but here uh, in the cosmological situation it takes an aggravated form. So uh, Mott believed that he solved the problem, but the issue is what exactly did he solve? So for that, I, we consider something we call the simplified model, a mini mod, minimal version of, of mod problem, which I want uh, to, to use as a test ground for whatever idea one may have of resolving the problem at hand. It's another situation in which we have a symmetry. It's a situation that is very, very simple to solve all the, you know, one could solve Schrodinger's equation in, 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 uh, precisely. <coughs> And the point of this uh, uh, very, very simple example is that whatever theory we want to bring about as solving the breakdown of symmetry in cosmology should also work in this setting without having to invoke an observer. So the setting is a very simple one. A wave functions, uh, a wave packet describing a single pa a free particle uh, centered at x equals zero and let's say symmetric in the, with respect to, to space, spatial inversion and a bunch, a couple of detectors, very simple uh, uh, detectors, located at a distance d from the, from, this, from the origin, one to the right, one to the left. Each one of the detectors has a very simple Hamiltonian, and each one of the detectors interacts with the particle through a very simple interaction, and it's very simple then that <coughs> to, to solve the, the uh, Schrodinger equation with the initial data telling me what that the initial wave packet was, where I, what I said was it was, and the two in, detectors were initially un, uh, unexcited. One can easily uh, find out that after a certain time, uh, the, the system will be described by, uh, by a, a wave function that contains 
a component that involves one of the detectors excited and the second detector unexcited or vice versa. There is also a component in which both detectors are, are unexcited and even a component in which both detectors uh, are excited. And one could claim at this point that, okay, we have solved the problem. This represents the probability that the, the particle was detected at the right, the, this at the left, and these other things are not so interesting. Uh, <clears throat> So in some sense, we are using a kind of Copenhagen interpretation when we, when, when we go this quickly ab ab about this problem, and we say, well, the problem is solved. What, what, what else do you want? And my point is that uh, we, don't, we shouldn't be so happy because it's obviously very easy to describe the same system in a different basis that is in particularly amenable to symmetric description, the basis in which the detector, uh, both detectors are excited, one in which the both detectors are unexcited, one symmetric combination of the excitation in the two sides and one anti-symmetric uh, combination for the detection of the both, both sides and describe everything in this language. And in this language, I will not be able to understand how the symmetry was broken. I will, <coughs> the, the, it's very easy to see that the, that the uh, symmetry of the, of, the, of the dynamics and of the initial state uh, will ensure that the, the, the fully asymmetric state is not excited, and then I will have no account for the breakdown of the symmetry. Nevertheless, uh, we know that in some sense the other basis is the right one, but we don't know why. So, <clears throat> in a laboratory, of course, we, uh, a, a physicist in the lab faces no, 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 no problem. He knows that he never perceives the, the detectors in a superposition, and then he knows that he should account for things in the first basis, and he, he goes happily uh, uh, home after, after seeing that his experiments fit with his predictions. Uh, however, in the universe, we cannot account for, for, uh, for any of these uh, uh, things, we, cannot, we, we don't want to use the, the, the observer and his experience with, with detectors to explain the breakdown of, of symmetry. Uh, actually, the, 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 the experimentalist cannot explain that. He just knows that, that this is the correct way to proceed, but he, ca he doesn't have a theory to explain uh, uh, things. So the question is then, should be uh, phrased, by saying, why should we believe the conclusions that are obtained with one of the contexts and not uh, with the second? The usual answers that uh, one finds in this regard is, well, this is the standard problem of quantum mechanics, uh, and let's uh, remember that we just make measurements. Uh, <clears throat> but even ignoring the issues with the measurement problem in general, uh, this would be saying that, uh, that in some sense our actions today are what make possible the breakdown of the symmetry in the very early times of the universe, and that generated the galaxies and stars that makes us possible. This is a very uncomfortable uh, uh, situation from, the, from, from any kind of conceptual point of view. Uh, then there are uh, uh, other arguments that uh, are based in uh, the coherence type of analysis and many world interpretations. And this uh, point of view also has, from, my point of, from our point of view, of uh, a, a problematic account. One, uh, to start this kind of analysis, one needs first to, to select some degrees of freedom that one decides to call the environment and then trace over, over these uh, degrees of freedom. The first problem is that in, in doing so, the selection arguments for, for discarding certain degrees of freedom involve our inabilities to measure them. So again, we are using our presence here as part of the, of the uh, analysis. So perhaps uh, using uh, James Hartle characterization, what I'm saying is that we need, we require a third person description and account of how the symmetry was broken that therefore does not involve us. After all, you know, if I ask you, you know, what happened to the dinosaurs and, uh, and you, tell me, well, the, the dinosaurs went extinct, and I ask you, well, why did they, get, why did they go extinct? And, and, and we say, well, uh, they, they go extinct because we are here, and we wouldn't be here if they didn't go extinct. That is not a very satisfactory answer. We prefer an answer in which there was a meteorite that came down and destroyed 
the dinosaurs, and we happen to be a result of the fact that they disappear and made the Earth hospitable for beings, weak, weakly beings like ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> moreover, uh, even if one traces over, over certain degrees of freedom and obtains uh, diagonal metrics, of course there is a problem in, uh, in the uh, interpretation of uh, the coherent metrics as indicating that the situation is now described by one of the elements of the diagonal. This is a well uh, understood problem uh, that even decoherent uh, uh, proponents uh, acknowledge. <clears throat> uh, finally, one needs, in, 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 uh, if one needs then to use something like many world interpretations by, to somehow select the, indicate that each one of the elements of the diagonal in the decoherent matrix represents an alternative world, uh, one needs some way to select, uh, select the basis in which this this world uh, uh, splits, and, and, and uh, or the many worlds come about, and it's not clear what plays the role here. Again, we don't want the mind, the mind or the consciousness to play a role in this uh, scheme. Perhaps I am being in strong disagreement with Bernard in this point, but but uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, show a statement by by Surek that he has one of been one of the persons who has. Is, uh, work very strongly on, 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 uh, on decoherence and, 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 and related uh, things. And he says, the interpretation of uh, you know, quantum mechanics based on the ideas of decoherence and A in selection, or that is selection of the basis in which we will uh, talk about the system, uh, has not been spelled out. I have man, made many attempts, but I have uh, postponed this task basically because this question tends to involve anthropic art, uh, attributes like the perception, awareness, consciousness, things that I, at the present, we cannot model in a desirable degree of rigor. And my point is that in the cosmological situation, even if we could model them with all the rigor you want, it would not help. Um, there is an even uh, more problematic uh, problem when, uh, with the coherence when uh, the situation that one wants to consider involves uh, symmetry. And that can be very easily seen in an EPR uh, experiment. Uh, for example, let's consider an EPR part that results from a J equals zero decay into two particles into two directions. Of course, this situation, uh, even after the decay, uh, has taken place in this direction, has a symmetry of rotation around the C-axis. And that is, in, in fact, uh, 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 easily seen in the, fact, in, the, in the fact that the singlet state of the system is, uh, is this. The point is that if I decide to consider the particle number one, uh, the environment, and concentrate on particle number two, or vice versa, and trace, and therefore look at the reduced density matrix, the reduced density matrix turns out to be proportional to the identity, and therefore doesn't, doesn't give me any way to select the basis. I could have done this in the, I did this in the X basis, but I could have done it in the Y basis or any other basis that you want. And there, the, it's very easy to show a theorem that, show, that indicates that this problem is generic whenever you have a symmetric situation. <clears throat> Then uh, there is a, a, another proposal, which is the, con the consistence or the coherent uh, history uh, uh, approach. We believe that the, 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 the consistent history approach has some, some problems in general, but in particular in this situation, it allows me to conclude with probability one, if I start with the state I gave you, and if I ask the questions in a particular way, that our universe today is homogeneous and isotropic. And if I cannot trust that conclusion, I don't see why I should trust any other conclusion that I can obtain uh, with the scheme. So <clears throat> our approach, since we went basically through the existing ways to address this problem, uh, we, we decided that we need something else, and this something else, uh, I, I, I said what it, what it was. Uh, one thing that allows you to be bold in this situation is that uh, <clears throat> we are facing here a very unique uh, example, the, the, the unique situation we have at hand in which these three things ca come together, quantum theory, gravitation, and observations. There are many other situations in which the two, two of these components appear, but only one, one in which these three uh, components uh, are there. 
So we want to uh, uh, tell a story. We, we want a physical theory that allows us to tell a story that really accounts for the breakdown of, of, of symmetry, that really uh, accounts for the emergence of, of the seeds of structure, and therefore that, that theory, that description, that physical process should be a process that occurs in time, because emergence means that something that was not there at a certain time is there at a later time. Uh, and, the, and therefore, for that, we need, uh, uh, we need that, that uh, theory to explain the breakdown of the symmetry as occurring in time. Well, collapse theories can do that. I, there is a long history, as I said, of, of work in this direction. Uh, Girardi, Rimini, Weber, Pearl, Diossi, Penrose, Bassi, and there are rel uh, relatively new versions that try to make the theory compatible with, with uh, uh, relativity, because that's one of the serious concerns of, of these kinds of, of, of theories. Recently, Weinberg has gotten interested in the, in the subject. Uh, so what we will do here is to uh, consider the inflationary process, the inflationary paradigm, and add to it uh, the, this, uh, this self-induced collapse process described by one of these theories. In particular, here I will use the CSL theory proposed by Philip Pearl in an adaptation to the situation at hand. Uh, of course, it's clear that, that this cannot be regarded at this point as more than, than a perhaps interesting toy model because we need, of course, to have a, a, a fully covariant description if we want to, to give it any, any serious credence. Credence. Okay, uh, before I go uh, there, because you know, this is, uh, to many people, this kind of, of, these kinds of proposals are very shocking, uh, it would be nice to see if this means departing completely from, from our understanding of physics or, or is really something that may, may fit well after a lot of effort, of course. So how would this thing, how would something like that uh, fit with our understanding of of, uh, uh, of physics, let's recall that uh, there are very serious difficulties that are still outstanding. Uh, there is the problem of time that appears generically in, in, in quantum theories, uh, canonical quantum theories that, that try to, 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 to be applied to, 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 to relativity, to, to, to general relativity. Uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> And even in some of the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, prominent attempts to, to, to quantize the theory, it's completely unclear how to recover uh, space-time from, from those theories. The, the, this process of, of recovering the standard notions of space-time involves a lot of uh, uh, dirty handling. For example, in the problem, in, in, in one of the most popular approach to appro one of the most popular approaches to deal with problem number one is to consider some dynamical variable uh, as a clock, and then to consider relative probabilities and relative wave functions. And it seems that when one does that, uh, one ends up obtaining not the Schrodinger equation, but some. Schrodinger equation with modifications that involve violations of unitarity. Could this perhaps be at the bottom of what, at the phenomenological level that I will be using, looks like a collapse theory? That is, will collapse will be part of the description of nature once we recover time from a timeless theory in, in, in such a setting? Uh, second, uh, in general, recovering space-time, even space-time from from the theories uh, is not easy. There are even many suggestions that, that uh, uh, space-time may be an emergent phenomena and that the description of space-time uh, may have uh, to be done in terms of degrees of freedom that have no uh, connection with the, our standard notions of space and time. And in that sense, we could think of an hydrodynamical analogy. So in this uh, language, one, one could imagine that <clears throat> GR is like the theory of Navier-Stokes equation, and therefore I will not imagine that the theory holds perfectly 100% all the times. For example, like I know that the, 
the hydrodynamic description of a fluid will break down whenever there are cusps or waves breaking or things of that sort in which flux of energy will occur between the macroscopic and microscopic degrees of freedom. So I wouldn't be surprised when I take this point of view if the equations of GR don't hold precisely uh, all the time and has corrections. So, uh, so the, in view of all this, the, pro the, the proposal is to uh, uh, incorporate uh, the collapse uh, description for the degrees of freedom that represent the matter in the inflationary uh, uh, scenario, uh, but keep a, a classical description for GR. So we, we, we have made precise, more or less precise, this notion of, in terms of something we call the semi-classical self-consistent configurations, uh, and this would be the idea of how they would be incorporated into collapse. Uh, again, the idea that, that the quantum, that the quantum, uh, of, that the theory of, of uh, uh, of gravity uh, would have a good description uh, in terms of a classical, uh, in terms of a classical uh, GR uh, seems natural if the curvatures involved are much smaller than the Planck scale, which is the scale in which one thinks quantum gravity actually will, will need to be uh, invoked. An inflationary regime, the inflation is, uh, occurs in a regime in which this certainly holds. So <clears throat> the practical treatment, how am I doing on time? Five to 10 minutes. Five to 10 minutes? Okay. Can I have some water? Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do this in practice? So I'll, I'll follow the, the standard uh, inflationary uh, scheme in which I take the background that I have described previously. I add perturbations of the metric and of the scalar field. <clears throat> and um, and the, big part, the big difference in, in our treatment here is that we will quantize the scalar perturbations, but we will, will not quantize uh, the metric. Now, to this we will apply, to, to that setting we will apply this uh, continuous spontaneous localization theory. And so let me tell you a little bit about the theory. Uh, the theory has been developed for uh, particle physics, non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics of several particles. And the basic uh, uh, ingredient is a modification of the Sch uh, Schrodinger evolution that includes the Hamiltonian, the standard Hamiltonian part, and a component that produces collapse. To determine this part, we, we need three elements. There would be a stochastic function of time, <clears throat> one for every degree of freedom that uh, is involved in the, in, in, the, in the theory here. There will be a parameter lambda that controls how intense this collapse is, and there will be an operator that determines what is the basis into which the collapse occurs. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the time order operator, standard time order operator. The second component of the theory is a probability rule. It's clear that this evolution is not, uni not unitary, not unitarity, uh, not unitary, not unitary. Uh, so the norm of the vector that results from evolving the, uh, of the initial vector with a given function w is, not gen is in general not one. One can compute that uh, amplitude, and that amplitude is going to be part is going to be used to determine the probability that the function w occurs. So that the, the, the probability that the realization, the particular realization of a, a certain uh, random function occurs in nature is given by this rule. The interesting, the, the theory was constructed to unify, therefore, the, both evolution processes in the in quantum mechanics, the unitary evolution controlled by this part and the reduction part controlled by this part. <coughs> the proposal that has been made in, uh, in, in the context of particle physics takes this operator A to be the position operator, actually a smeared version of the position operator. And that has the effect of ensuring that when you have a particle interacting with a system made of a, of a very large number of particles, the entanglement produced by the interaction will, will cause 
the effective collapse rate to increase them dramatically, and that is what accounts for the fact that in stern gerlach the electron will go into one of the paths and not the other, and of course, the magnet will recoil in the uh, opposite direction. That's what the theory has been constructed. The theory has 25 years uh, in existence, and people have tested this theory uh, in the lab. The test in the lab allowed you to put constraints on the parameter lambda. The parameter lambda that is uh, extracted from analysis by, G by, by Gerardi Rimini Weber, which well, this version is, is, is related to, the, to that one, it's just a continuous version of that one, uh, is, uh, takes this value, 10 to the minus 16 seconds to the minus 1, likely to depend on the mass of the particles this is supposed to apply uh, to electrons. <clears throat> and the parameter is chosen to be small enough not to conflict with precision uh, experiments testing quantum mechanics in the lab, and large enough to ensure that superposition of microscopic objects lasts very, very small, smaller time than our perception uh, would allow. Okay, so now we apply this to the cosmological setting at hand, which is, as I said, the, uh, I will consider only at this point the, the um, so-called scalar perturbations of the metric. This is the only part of the metric that contains spatial dependences, and that's, therefore is the, is the excitation of that thing is the, is the, will signal the breakdown of homogeneity and uh, isotropy in the space-time. And we will use Einstein's semi-classical equations, and the state here will be the state that is evolving from the Bunch-Davis vacuum uh, in time, but using this collapse dynamics because if we don't use these collapse dynamics, the state will not break the symmetry and nothing will be produced. This can be seen very uh, easily in the following uh, case. Okay, so let, let me just uh, uh, say some of the components of, of the things that we need to do. We need now to consider the perturbations of the uh, scalar field and its momentum conjugate, decompose it into Fourier uh, uh, modes. We know that the wave function, the initial wave function, has a certain uncertainty both in, in field and momentum uh, uh, initially, and the collapse will modify the state, and generically, the expectation values of both field and momentum will not longer vanish as they do in the uh, uh, ground state or in the bunch David, uh, da Davis uh, vacuum. Um, so, how that. If, if I now substitute into the uh, Einstein semi-classical equations, the perturbation that I, that I have just described, this equation, which is basically the analogous of Newton's equation, tells me what is the uh, scalar perturbation in mode K in terms of the expectation value of the momentum conjugate to the field in the corresponding state that I have. <clears throat> It's very easy to see that this expectation value is zero in the Bunch-Davis vacuums. Therefore, this object is zero, and therefore the space-time will remain homogeneous and isotropic unless the, symmet unless the state jumps to something else. The theory, as I said, will break that, uh, that uh, uh, isotropy, uh, that, that those symmetries, and then I will have, I will generate a Newtonian uh, some this perturbation, which is called a Newtonian potential. This Newtonian potential is related to the temperature uh, variations in, this, in the surface of last scattering. Therefore, I can convert an expression of this potential in, to a map in the temperature on the surface of last scattering, uh, <coughs> uh, simply reconstructing the, reconstructing the Newtonian potential. Uh, and from there, I can read out what are these famous parameters, alpha Lm, which is the, the, the component of the temperature variation map uh, in, the, in a particular spherical harmonic, which has now this, this expression. There is, in the standard approach to the, to the problem, there is no analogous expression to this one, which t tells me what exactly is one, alpha L one of the alpha Lms. Of course, it seems that we have a lot of predictive power, but the point is that the functions that control what this uh, state is, and therefore what this expectation value is, involve randomness. These functions are random functions of space-time that I cannot tell you what they are. If I could, I could tell you exactly what, what each alpha LM would be. So now, 
the task is to try to estimate what this alpha LM would be. What we see is that I have here a sum of many random numbers. Well, this is an integral, actually. But it's a sum of many numbers involving some parts that are very well determined and some parts that involve randomness. I need to do, to do this. Okay. So, so, so computing this sum is like computing a, a, a random walk in two dimensions, because it's, of course, a complex number. To compute a, a, a to compute a random walk, what I can do is to estimate the most likely value of the magnitude of the random walk. I cannot do anything better. And that involves now computing this quantity, which looks very similar to the quantity that is computed in standard approaches, but there is a very important difference. Here, we have expectation values, the product of two expectation values, and I have to do an average over an ensemble of realizations. This is very different from the standard thing that is computed, which is the computation of the two-point function. One key aspect of this difference is the fact that when the space-time is homogeneous and isotropic, using this calculation, I will obtain zero, which is the only conceivable result in an in a, in a homogeneous and isotropic case. You will not obtain zero if you do it the, the other way. So the other way produces things that I cannot understand. Um, OK, so how am I doing on time? Five more for me to talk, and then five for, five for descriptions. OK, so then the task is used to use CSL to compute this quantity. But I know already what this quantity should be. I know that this quantity, I, put, I substitute this quantity in, the, in, the, in this equation. And it's only if this quantity becomes proportional to k this, that I obtain the standard flat spectrum that I know is the thing that fits with the data. So now I want to learn about my collapse theory. What does the collapse theory have to do in order to produce the right result? Uh, so let me just concentrate in one, in one single uh, uh, mode. For that, it's convenient to change variables to the rescale mode and rescale momentum. It's also convenient to put everything in a box, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these are all details. And then I need to compute, as I said, this quantity. Again, the expectation value of the momentum conjugate square average, not this other quantity that is what is usually computed. When I, now I need to select in my theory, in my collapse theory, two things. I need to select uh, <clears throat> what is the operator that controls the collapse. So I'm going to use all the machinery that we had for collapsing in the, in the uh, version of uh, uh, ordinary quantum mechanics of CSL, in which the operator was the smeared position operator. Here, we'll, I will use the uh, momentum conjugate to the field as the, as the collapse operator. I put that into the equation, solve, and compute this quantity. And at very late times, I obtain this expression. Here in this expression, I have uh, well, the, the objects that appear are this parameter lambda, that is the CSL uh, collapse rate. K is the wave vector of the, that I'm looking at, the wave number of the, of, or yeah, the, the magnitude of the wave vector I'm, I'm looking at. And T is the time, the conformal time uh, from the moment in which the uh, inflation starts until the moment I'm computing the, this, this quantity, which is, let's say, at the end of inflation. <clears throat> As you see, the expression that one obtains, first of all, vanishes if lambda is zero. If I turn off the collapse rate, the, there is nothing, and the space-time remains homogeneous and isotropic. I turn on lambda, and now I obtain something that is not exactly what I would like. Therefore, for this theory to have a chance to work, I need to assume that lambda is now a function of k. Otherwise, I can throw the theory into the garbage. So let me assume that the, the that the lambda be has become a function of k by making this substitution. I, I will now uh, uh, explain why, why how, how can this, this make sense. If lambda becomes a, 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 a a function of k, and actually now becomes has the correct dimensions, dimension of time to the minus one, which is the same dimension that it had in the in the particle case. 
I substitute, and, I, and again, I get a spectrum that is proportional to k, but is not exactly proportional to k, has corrections. So generically, one thing we have found with various attempts to use this idea in various collapse schemes is that you don't obtain generically the exact flat spectrum. You, you obtain corrections. For this case, when I fit this as the dominant term, <clears throat> I, use, I use granulification scale for inflation, and I use standard values for the duration of inflation, I can obtain the value of this parameter. The value that I obtain, one obtains for asking this to, to produce the 10 to the minus 5 fluctuations that we see in the sky, requires this parameter to be of the order uh, of 10 to the minus 19 seconds to the minus 1. That, the first thing to note is that this number is not very far. It's just three orders of magnitude. Well, it could three orders. <laughs> it's just, just three orders of magnitude from an estimate that was also very rough, but given by Girardi, Rimini, Weber, of what should be the value of the parameter in the lab. But that we should take with, with a grain of salt, because, of course, this theory, have, I have bluntly taken the theory from the particle physics domain to the field theory domain, and, and, uh, and we don't really know how to, how to do that. The second thing is that there will be corrections, and it turns out that for the, these numbers, these values of the corrections, the, the mm, mm, uh, corrections will be larger in the regions of small k, which is the regions in which, fortunately or unfortunately, the, the uh, CMB is, is uh, less well determined, let's say. Uh, but even there, uh, the estimates using these numbers suggest that the corrections will be 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So it's not uh, easy to see. But they, will, they, they are there. There is a signature of the theory. Uh, of course, the theory looked very, very ugly. At the, at, uh, uh, in the moment, but let's remember, let's remember that when I apply the theory, I should here have a sum, I am applying it now to all the modes, so I should have here sum over all modes of these objects, <clears throat> one, wave, one function of time for each mode and one operator for each mode, so I can rewrite everything in terms of the of the field, doing the inverse Fourier transform, rewrite everything in terms of the field, and now the, the, the equation uh, turns out to take this form, which is not so ugly. It's the Hamiltonian of uh, the evolution of the Hamiltonian. Here is the full-fledged uh, uh, Hamiltonian for the, for the uh, inflaton field. And here we have something that is written in terms of the inflat of, of a random function of space-time. So a collection of, well, a random function of space and time, which is constructed by inverse Fourier transforming the, the, other, Fourier, uh, the, other, Fourier, the other random functions that were functions of time and wave number only. Uh, and something that looks like the field, uh, but it's not exactly the field. It has this, this strange object, uh, Laplacian to the 1, 4, Zero. OK. Uh, one can do this some, something similar uh, if one collapses the, the momentum operator, which is actually the one uh, that, I, that I show. Uh, it's clear that uh, what, what would be reasonable is to have one generic theory that applies all the way from the particle physics realm to the cosmological setting. We are not there yet. The research must continue. But we already know what is the form that the theory should have in order to produce correct results in the inflationary regime. We know what is the form it should have to product, produce correct results in the particle physics from a, domain. And of course, the research uh, must continue. Thank you very much. So do we have questions? Done. At one point, I didn't quite see it, but you had this, this semi-classical Einstein equation you sent there was something subtle there. Is it, I mean, isn't that true? Because your, your, your wave function is not evolving unitarily, so this T mu nu may not be covariantly conserved. That's right. So what, what do you do in the end of it? Because, of course, the Einstein equation is just geometrically the basic banking unit. So how do you, how do you set it? Okay, how do you, so you say the, the point of view is that the equation, what we have resolved in that, in, in that setting is what to do with when a collapse occurs and there is one single collapse. 
So what we have done is the following. Ima imagine that this collapse in, uh, 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 represents some breakdown of the description of space-time in terms of geometrical objects, and that, and that in the in this interface, this collapse moment, the microscopic degrees of freedom come into play, like if you had a wave breaking, and microscopic degrees. So before the collapse, you want Einstein equations to hold. After the collapse, you want the equations of, uh, uh, to hold. And then you glue the two, equation, the two metrics together. So you, you glue, and then you, you have a jump in the extrinsic curvature. Oh, OK. You have a jump in the extrinsic curvature. Yep. Do we have more questions? So if not, oh, it's OK. One last question, and then we'll stop for the coffee break. Well, it won't be a surprise that I don't agree with your motivation, okay. but that doesn't prevent you from um, uh, formulating a collapse model and comparing it with the existing experiment. So I gather this parameter is in principle uh, measurable in the CMB if we have sufficient accuracy? Well, if you s yes, that's correct. In principle, it's measurable if this is the correct theory, which... Yeah, well, we, let's, let's of course. assume it's the correct yeah. theory. Yeah, if it's, it's the correct theory, then... You see, here we have something that goes like k, mm -hmm. but when you put all this, you, you, well, you, saw, you assume that this parameter is small, and we know what this parameter is, and the, and the values of the k that uh, are relevant for the CMB, we know what mm -hmm. the values are, so this number is small. We put everything together, and you have a correction that goes like 1 over k, mm -hmm. and is of the order of 10 to the minus 6 at the lowest case that, that we have. Right. So it's in principle c. Uh, Okay, and is something going to collapse the geometry eventually? Sorry? Will something collapse the geometry? The geometry is collapsing because the geometry is reacting through the semi-classical Einstein equation to the collapse of the state. But when it's not semi-classical? Sorry? When it's not semi-classical. Oh, when it's not semi-classical, you will have to have a quantum gravity description, yeah. and I don't know what it is. Ah, okay. Thanks. The, the assumption is that there's some other degree of freedom that is not geometrical. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to stop here because I was told the coffee is already served. Thank you.